I got a lot of really interesting questions and comments over the last couple of weeks. And on top of everything, I had to pull one video and I wanted to explain why I did that. So today we're going to do another question and answer session. Your questions about immersive audio, my hopefully useful answers. Before I get started, I wanted to point out that I'm still trying to answer every single question and comment that I'm getting on my videos. At the moment, this is still possible. However, over the last couple of weeks, I started to notice that I'm not seeing everything. So sometimes YouTube doesn't show me all your questions and all your comments. If that is the case uh, and I'm not answering your question, it's not because I'm ignoring you. I just didn't see it. Usually what happens is that once I see it, I will answer it. So it might come a little bit late, but I'm trying to answer everything. Now, if for whatever reason you're waiting for a response and that response is not coming, you can also simply join our Discord community. An invent link is in the description below and there you will find a lot of like-minded people who are interested in immersive and spatial audio and they will answer all kinds of things and give all kinds of recommendations. And with that being said, let's hop into our first comment and that comes from DaddyDanny5588 and DaddyDanny commented, great tutorial, no, first of all, thank you. But I think we can mix it without head tracking. And that comment came to a video about monitoring ambisonics with Waves and X in Nuendo or Cubase. Now, I do realize that the situation in this video was a little bit different because we worked with ambisonics. And most people who are working with ambisonics have a sophisticated speaker setup because they're using ambisonics in a live performance environment. And that certainly means that they can actually monitor everything correctly in the setup that they're using. However, I nevertheless decided to include that comment because I hear that uh, a lot, especially with respect to Dolby Atmos, that head tracking isn't really necessary. We can just do a binaural downmix and everything will be fine. And this is actually not really the case. And I also wanted to point out that my personal opinion has actually changed quite a bit over the last couple of months. I used to think about head tracking as a workaround in case you don't really have a speaker layout that is appropriate. So for example, if you're working in Dolby Atmos and you don't have a Dolby Atmos studio, you don't have 7.1.4 speakers, then uh, head tracking is a workaround. However, the more I think about it and the more um, things develop, I feel that head tracking is actually almost a must. And the reason it is a must is simply because of the way people listen to Dolby Atmos. It is true that if you have a 7.1.4 speaker layout or a 9.1.6 speaker layout in your Dolby Atmos studio, nothing compares to the quality that you achieve in that particular studio, but you need to think about how people are actually listening to the results that you're producing. And the way they're listening is simply with uh, these. Uh, and these are head-tracked binaural audio. So um, my feeling is that unless you really have some way of monitoring with head-tracking, you're not really able to understand how people listen to your production. So I feel that head tracking is actually a must. You have to have some sort of head tracking setup, ideally one that includes the Apple AirPods because that's essentially how most people listen to binaural audio or listen to Dolby Atmos. But I would really like to hear your opinion about that topic. Uh, is head tracking something that you use? Is it useful for you? Is it uh, something that you think has to be done in order to understand how people listen to your immersive audio productions? Let me know in the comment section below. I would be interested in learning more about how you guys approach that particular topic. The next question comes from Zerstärker, and this is really an important one because I get that a lot. And here she writes in response to a video that I did about how to start with Dolby Atmos in Reaper. He writes, I don't get it. Why not just use Re's round pen? It can do any of the 3D panning for any loudspeaker setup. Now, this is something that most beginners don't really realize, but Dolby Atmos is more than just a speaker layout. Dolby Atmos is actually about objects and uh, beds and how objects can be moved around. And the problem with that is that unless you're using the music panner that comes with the Dolby Atmos renderer, you're not really communicating the panning information from the DAW into the Dolby Atmos renderer. And therefore, your Dolby Atmos files aren't really including all the information. Yes, you can, obviously use Reese around panner and any panner really in order to pen your audio in a particular speaker layout. But that essentially means that everything that you do is locked into that speaker layout and you're not gaining the advantages that you have by using objects in a Dolby Atmos setup. So unless you are really producing for one particular speaker layout, 
And uh, if you want to take advantage of the flexibility that Dolby Atmos provides, you unfortunately have to stick to the music panel that comes with the Dolby Atmos renderer. Holy shit, that was explained so well. I needed a quick refresh on the topic and uh, that was just perfect. Thanks. Well, first of all, thank you. And I'm really glad that I could be helpful. And if any of you have similar feelings like True Story had, please use the comment section below. The YouTube algorithm really needs your input. Otherwise, my videos are not going to be found by anybody. And if you don't like my videos, also mention it. Um, I'm always interested in learning more and uh, trying to get better. So I really need your feedback. Use the comment section below. The next question comes from the Willi. I hope I pronounce your handle correctly. If not, I apologize. And the question is, great video. Once again, thank you. Just a quarter of an hour ago, I watched a video where a mixing engineer said he would return the Slate VSX system. And you say the opposite here. So my question is, do you recommend this for an amateur like I am? If you say yes, I'll probably purchase it. Now, this question was made in response to a video that I did about uh, mix room plugins. And in that video, I specifically said that I liked the Slate VSX system. If you're not familiar with that, that is a simulation of a mixing environment. So you can essentially mix with your headphones. That's the basic idea. And uh, you get the feeling as if you would be in a real studio environment. And I felt that uh, Slate VSX really worked best for me. Now, the reason I'm including this question here is simply because whatever I say and however excited I am about a particular plugin, Never use that as a reason to purchase something. Always make sure that you test everything yourself. Because everything that I'm going to talk about is uh, somewhat subjective. I'm trying to be as objective as I can, but in the end it is subjective because it's my opinion. And I want to really make sure that nobody goes out and purchases quite expensive plugins because I say you should purchase that. Always make sure that you test everything yourself and uh, never listen to anybody really on the internet to tell you what to purchase and what not to purchase. Here's another comment that talks about using the panner of a digital audio workstation uh, in order to produce Dolby Atmos, even though that panner is not really Dolby Atmos capable. Observation Audio writes, uh, in response to a video that I did about the trick uh, where we used uh, Fiddle Audio Space Lab in order to have a 64 channel multi-track routed into the Dolby Atmos renderer, into the Fiddler, Fiddler Audio Dolby Atmos Composer. And Observation Audio writes, uh, you can do multi-channel input with the regular Composer beam and then put the new Reaper panner in front of it and then you have more robust panning option and volume control for every track inputted in one place. Bus, that's how I do it. Now, I do want to point out that there's nothing inherently wrong with doing it that way. If this is your preferred workflow, then by all means do it that way. However, we are once again in that situation where we are doing the panning before we are actually routing. And by using the Reaper panner, you're not really communicating the panning information into the Dolby Atmos Composer. And therefore, you're not really using the panning information inside of Dolby Atmos. What you're really doing is you're generating a multi-channel audio and then essentially placing the speaker positions of that multi-channel audio into your Dolby Atmos image or into your Dolby Atmos space. And while it is possible to do it that way, you once again lose all the flexibility that you have by using the panning within the objects or with the objects in Dolby Atmos. So yes, you can do it that way. I just wouldn't do that because once again, you are losing some of the flexibility of Dolby Atmos. Next question comes from Big Waveform and Big Waveform simply asks, what is the easiest door to start with Dolby Atmos? Now there's a lot of movement in that particular space. Uh, a lot of digital audio workstations are implementing Dolby Atmos workflows and uh, these workflows are changed almost on a weekly basis. So what I'm saying today might not be my opinion next week. However, at the moment, there's a very clear answer to that question, and that is Studio One. The way Presonus implemented the Dolby Atmos workflow in Studio One is second to none. No other digital audio workstation does it as straightforward as Presonus did it with Studio One. So if you are starting out with Dolby Atmos, uh, my recommendation, at the moment at least, is very, very clearly Studio One. I'm honestly not completely sure how to pronounce that, but Ricey writes, your videos about Dolby Atmos have been so helpful as we've added this content to our program at Western Michigan University. Well, first of all, thank you. And I'm really glad that I could be helpful. And I included that comment simply because I wanted to point out that if you're working at an educational institution or if you are a student, for example, and you have any questions, you you can always reach out to me. There are many students that have reached out to me over the years, and uh, I'm always happy to give advice. Now, if you want to use any of my content, feel free to do so in any way, shape or form possible. 
if you want to use it as a negative example, you can also do that. I don't really mind. I create these videos in order to help other people in the implementation or in the use of immersive audio. And if uh, my videos are helpful for that purpose, um, feel free to use whatever you need. The next question is a really interesting one, and it's actually the one question that triggered me to make this video. It was uh, made by Nelson Leroy in response to my video about getting started with Dolby Atmos in Studio One 6.5, so the one that actually includes the Dolby Atmos workflow. And Nelson Leroy writes, uh, Hey Michael, you did not set a headphone output in Binaural, so I wonder how can you monitor the actual Dolby Atmos mix? And why put the reverb on the main channel instead of a regular FX channel? Um, I'm trying to figure out what you want to demonstrate. Now, this is interesting for me for one particular reason. I actually had a meeting with the good people from Presonos, and uh, we talked about all kinds of things about Dolby Atmos in Studio One. And by the way, these are really excellent uh, developers. So I got uh, a completely different understanding about the development process and a completely new appreciation about the quality of work that Presonos puts into Studio One. So this is also one of the reasons why I'm really excited about Studio One. But they also asked the same question. In particular, they asked me why I put the reverb on the main channel and not on an effects track. And the reason for that is uh, in the nature of the Dolby Atmos bed. The Dolby Atmos bed maxes out at 7.1.2, and that essentially means that the Dolby Atmos bed is not a fully immersive track. It only has two overhead speakers. Uh, in order to be really fully immersive, you would need to have more than two. And that essentially means that if you're creating immersive audio, the bed isn't really that particularly useful. There are actually people out there who specifically try to avoid the bed at all costs possible. Now, I'm not that strict, but uh, for most situations, I do believe that the bed isn't particularly useful. There's only one situation where I think I, the bed actually might make a lot of sense, and that is with the reverb. Because if you are using a immersive reverb, the fact that you are missing a couple of overhead speakers isn't really that much of a problem. The two overhead speakers are actually perfectly fine for a reverb, and that's why I simply use the bed only for reverb purposes. And if you only use it for reverb purposes, then you can just put the reverb on the bed bus and you don't have to use a special effects track. So that's really the only reason, the fact that the bed isn't particularly useful for immersive objects or for immersive audio. And um, reverb is really the only practical use where I think uh, the bed actually makes sense. Now, the first part of that question is something that starts to really annoy me a little, and that is the fact that many people think that if you are not listening to Dolby Atmos in Binaural, you are not really listening to Atmos, and that's simply not the case. Uh, Binaural is just a way to render Dolby Atmos. It's not the only way to do that. You can also render it in stereo, and you can render it in 5.1, in 7.1, in 5.1.2, whatever. Right? There are many, many ways you can uh, render Dolby Atmos. And uh, stereo and binaural are two different ways to approach Dolby Atmos, and um, none of them is better than the other, it's just they are different. Uh, binaural is meant for headphone use, uh, stereo is meant for speaker use, but it's still the Dolby Atmos mix. Uh, there's not, <laughs> it's not like that uh, by listening to stereo, you're suddenly not listening to Dolby Atmos, that's not the case. It's still a down mix of Dolby Atmos. And uh, therefore, you know, kind of doesn't make any difference. Now, the main reason I'm primarily using stereo instead of binaural in my videos is because many people are not listening to my videos with headphones. And uh, if they're not listening with headphones, then the binaural downmix actually gives a completely wrong impression. If you're using binaural, you really need to make sure that you're listening to it uh, on headphones. And uh, I feel that stereo is just a safe option to go. But uh, once again, you know, kind of, uh, <laughs> you don't need to have a binaural down mix in order to listen to Dolby Atmos. Um, it's still the same Atmos mix, it's just rendered differently. Louis Misfit asks Could you please review the new Ambisonic Spanner from Plugin Alliance? I sometimes do plugin reviews, although I'm not really a, a reviewer. If you are reviewing plugins correctly, you actually need to spend a lot of time with those plugins, and uh, my day job usually doesn't allow me to do that. However, if something is really interesting, I have a look at it and I give you my first impressions. So it's really most of the time if I'm doing plugin reviews, it's more of a first impressions kind of review. And uh, as I said in an earlier answer to a question, you always need to make sure that you test everything yourself. Now, there are a couple of interesting things coming out and there are a couple of interesting plugins that have been released over the last couple of weeks, and I'm certainly going to do a couple of reviews of those. I'm honestly not completely sure yet if I'm going to review the 
THX Panner that Plugins Alliance uh, released. And the reason for that simply is that while it says it is 3D audio, it actually isn't. It is a plugin that is just a stereo plugin. It has stereo in input and a stereo output. And it does some 3D magic in between, but it isn't really, it's not an ambisonic Panner, first of all. And uh, it's also not really an immersive audio plugin. It just says that it is one. And this is also one of the problems that I am running into quite often, that a lot of people look at these plugins and because the marketing language says it is an immersive audio plugin, they get excited about it. But then it turns out that it actually isn't. It's just marketing language to kind of take advantage of a certain hype. Um, I might once again look at the THX panel. I'm not yet completely sure, but uh, it's not an immersive audio plugin, unfortunately. It's just a stereo plugin. Final comment comes from Lucky Japan 88 and uh, Lucky Japan wrote, thanks for the quick correction to avoid further confusion. And that was actually in response to the video that I decided to pull. It was a video about how to use Ambisonics in Studio One and I made two mistakes uh, that together actually ended up being a little bit too much. I don't mind if I have a mistake here and there, but in this particular case, uh, these two mistakes were actually big enough for me to pull the entire video and reshoot it. And I uploaded a new version of that video that has no mistakes. But I wanted to use this opportunity to talk a little bit about why I actually pulled that video. Now, in order to demonstrate what the issue was, uh, let me do the following. So what I've done here is I've opened up Reaper and I have a test file, which is technically an Ambisonics file, but it's a very special Ambisonics file. So let me just drop that into Reaper here. Uh, so that we see what we have here. And this is a file that I actually like to use quite a lot. It is essentially a 16 channel file. And uh, what it really does, it, it has it pings on each channel and the number of pings tells me the channel number. So the first channel has one ping, the second channel has two pings, the third channel has three pings and so forth. And by using this test file, I start to get an understanding uh, how the individual channels are routed within the, 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 the digital audio workstation. Now the problem with Studio One is that it actually uses a different channel ordering. Uh, so it doesn't load these files in, in exactly the way they are produced. And in order to see what I mean, let's just open up Studio One and let's drop the same file into Studio One. And if I'm now kind of opening that up, you can essentially see that the channel order is incorrect. So they, they kind of, they order things differently. So the number of the order or the, 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 the channel number does not correspond to the number of the, the channel as shown in Studio One. And the problem actually goes one step further. If you are using a plugin that uh, sits on that track, so let me just, for example, do the AX um, meter, which is the plugin that uh, comes with the SSA plugins. That is essentially a metering plugin that can meter the 16 channels. If I now play that, you will actually see that three channels are not identified by that plugin. So if I'm playing that, maybe let me, let me kind of uh, play that in a loop. And let's play that. It's, it seems perfectly fine, but as you can see, three channels are not identified at all. So there's like channel six, seven, eight, 11, and 13. It's actually five channels that are not seen by that plugin. And that ended up being a problem. So while I could use uh, 16 channel tracks in Studio One for working with Ambisonics, the problems ended up being that uh, plugins deal with the channel layout differently. And you need plugins that can actually work with the channel layout that Studio One provides. And the only set of plugins that can do that right now are the Audio Brewers plugins. Now, um, you would think that in theory, uh, as long as all the plugins are using the channels um, in the same way, the, the way Studio One kind of uses those layouts doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. And once again, you would be right. However, as we have seen, some plugins don't see certain channels at all. And then it becomes a bit of an issue whether a plugin actually communicates or kind of uses the channel correctly or not. And this was just a little bit too much to me and they decided to pull my original video, reshoot some of it and uh, focus on the Audio Pro solution because that's the one that I'm completely sure works as long as you're having the latest versions of the Audio Brewers plugins. But anything else is a little bit hit or miss. It might work, it might not work, but I cannot recommend anybody go out and purchase plugins if I'm not completely sure if they actually work correctly.
Now you might wonder why is that the case? Why are these channels so twisted in Studio One? And the answer to that is in the way VST3 plugins work and uh, in the way VST3 plugins take in multi-channel audio, which is not as intuitive as you might think. There are actually a couple of things that are a little bit specific to VST3 plugins. And unless the developer makes sure that the channels are ticking in in the correct order, they sometimes come in, come in incorrectly. And that's essentially what's happening here. Now, this is really everything I wanted to say today. Thanks again for watching my videos. I really appreciate it. If you have any additional questions or comments, please use the comment section below or join our Discord community. In that link is in the description below. And with that being said, see you at the next video.